welcome to the ministry of God's word presented by Thamu Naidu. Thamu is the apostolic and founding elder of Gate Ministry Santon, located in Gauteng, South Africa. Blessed with worldwide travel and teaching, his mandate is to communicate the ancient biblical blueprint for the accurate building of the Church of God. We are doing this series on the last days, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And it's, yes, we're moving at a slow pace, and the Holy Spirit is actually directing the messages because every Sunday I go home and reflect on what I shared, and I find that it is totally contrary at times to the way I structured the sequence of my notes. So, and I'm allowing for the wind of the Spirit to blow on my thoughts that are carried to you. And I'd like to think that they bring to you not my thoughts, but the mind of Christ. Uh, And I've learned how to allow the Holy Spirit to blow upon me so that I'm not a slave to my notes. Uh, And I've also prayed a very simple prayer, and I've asked you to pray that prayer also, that I will not explain the Holy Spirit to you, but the Holy Spirit through the breath I release, will explain himself to you. And that sometimes the greatest explanations of the Holy Spirit are found and discovered in subjective experiences. What do I mean by that? You can only say this is that, like Peter did, after the Holy Spirit came upon them, and thereafter he preached one of the most powerful sermons in Acts chapter 2, when he said this, referring to the experience of Pentecost, is that, Joel chapter 2, that we now have become witnesses to. Um, And so I'd like this phrase, this is that, to become part of your whole experience, that you would not just have a theoretical, intellectual, or theological view of what the Spirit is, but that each one of you will encounter him while I'm preaching. I'm believing that the Holy Spirit will fall upon us, drop upon us. Not the way we Pentecostals understand it, but the way the Holy Spirit wants to do it, in his own ineffable way. He would come upon you in a unique and and special way, and you would have an encounter with him. I'd like to think that some of you are already having it in the course of your, your walk with the Spirit, your life that is lived in the realm of Spirit. And not that you would, you know, deny him access to your life, but that every single moment you would become more and more conscious of the fact that the Holy Spirit lives and dwells amongst us. Our whole lives must be lived in the Holy Spirit. The administrations of God are communicated to us through the Spirit. You will never find that the three persons of the Spirit operating at the same time, uh, as in in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, see the three of them in three different administrations. You'll always see one administration that brings to us the fullness of the Godhead. That's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And while the Godhead is a mystery, and it's not something that we can just go around explaining, because God, in a sense, is inexplicable, yet he makes himself understandable and knowable to each one of us through administrations. And for example, in Genesis chapter 1, we see more specifically God, the Creator, speaking. And we have to use the lenses of the whole of the scriptures to know that in the speakings of God that presented and produced the agenda and the creative works of God, we see in Genesis chapter 1 just God the creator, who later on we discover is actually the progenitor, the author, the initiator, uh, whom we refer to as our father. So our father. Uh, We have to use special lenses to realize that there was a spirit present when he spoke. And by the time you get to John chapter 1 and so forth, you get to discover that the word was also very active in what God created. 
uh, everything God created by His Spirit, through His Word, through speaking. That's how we discover the three persons of the Holy Spirit. But the predominant person in the whole book of Genesis is the Creator who we know now in an affectionate way as Papa, Daddy, Father. So that's how we see it. Even when there was the administration of the Son, the incarnation of the Spirit of Christ in the earth, the eternal Logos, when He came to dwell with us, in the incarnation, you would have to discern the administrations of the Father and the Spirit through the Son, the visible, tangible, manifest face of God was son. But when we, when we try to, to uh, break down, analyze uh, critically uh, the administration of the ministry of God through the son, we discover that whatever the son did, he did it by the spirit of God. He, nothing was excluded. And if time permits, at some point today, I want to show you the absolute dependence of, of Jesus the eternal word upon the Holy Spirit to lead him to life in his humanity, in his, uh, in, his, in his mortal and corruptible frame, which was his human body. Not, I'm not talking about sin now. I'm talking about the infirmities of the human body, like being tired, like being hungry, like sleeping. Uh, all of those are limitations of a human body as a result of the fall. Jesus did not have an incorruptible body. His body only became incorruptible through the resurrection. He had to even succumb to eternal death and physical death before he knew the resurrection and the ascension. So the point I'm making is that the administrations of God don't just happen. Uh, You have to learn how to discern them. And presently, presently, since the advent of the new covenant which was sealed in the blood and then enshrined by by the power of God which came on the day of Pentecost. Since then, we now are living in the days of the Holy Spirit. So when you think about Acts chapter 2, we are talking about the last days of the Holy Spirit in that in no segment of the church of Jesus Christ which was birthed on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, should be functioning outside the leadership of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit must lead every aspect of our lives. There's no part of your existence can be given to personal opinion and your own Uh, ideas of how you should interpret the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Every detail of anyone who claims to be an integral part of the church of Jesus Christ, every single detail must be led and governed by the Holy Spirit. He can't be just a a kind of a figurehead leader, uh, just a, uh, a kind of a docetic leader to us. He can't be just viewed when we need him for our convenience. Every part of our lives need to be governed by the Holy Spirit. So when I say we are living in a season of the last days of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, I am saying that there's no part of your life, my life, and our corporate lives as a ministry that can exist outside of him. Is that clear? There's nothing you should be doing that you say, I'm doing in my own strength. You should make the Holy Spirit your crutch, your absolute dependence. In fact, he should be your life support, as I described him as a breath. If the air of the Holy Spirit is not in you, the breath of God is not in you. And if the breath of God is not in you, you're dead while you're still living. And this is how many people are living today. They're living in a vacuum They are zombies. They've just become almost um, ghost-like in in their whole lifestyle. And as a result, their lives are really devoid of the presence of God. Really. And that's eternal death. You you uh, You can function in eternal death while you still have human breath. 
Yeah. So when your, when your breath leaves your body, you're as dead as you were in the body. That's the point I'm making. And, then, and, and the outer darkness out there is no different to the outer darkness that you're already experiencing in here. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're alive. You have the power, not just of resurrection, but ascension. You don't just live in resurrection life, you live in ascension life, which means resurrection is the 40-day period that Jesus lived on the earth. Ascension is when he took the throne and broke the code and, and things erupted from the scroll. Uh, that's ascension life. It's governmental, it's authoritative, it's jurisdictional, it's influential, it's learning how to bring your enemy under your feet. It's learning how to live a triumphant life and to live it joyfully. That's resurrection life uh, and ascension life coupled together. How many of you need that? Too many of us say that we have the breath of God in us and we are resurrected. We can't die, but the way we live is defeated. And that's where we have to arise now and let the Holy Spirit. Because that Spirit operates from the same throne that we are supposed to be seated in, seated on uh, in Christ, which is uh, the throne from which the seven spirits of God uh, proceed. They proceed. They don't emanate, they proceed from those seven thrones, and, uh, from the throne. And I'm praying to God that we're going to raise up in this house a people of stature, people of influence, a people of government, a people of authority. No matter where you are, you will not live like a defeated Christian. You would live knowing that you are more than a conqueror through Christ. And that same spirit which was in Christ is now in you. And if he raised him from the dead, he can raise you from your dire situation. Amen? No defeat in this house. And we will not bow our knee to that no matter how tough the time, sir. And you need to understand that. So identification with Christ is determined. If you want to be involved with Christ, if you want to know what it is to have a crystal, logical, or Christocentric view of Christ, you cannot do it outside of having the person of the Holy Spirit in you. And if we want the formation of Christ, the Holy Spirit is critical. Why am I saying that? Because last week I spoke on blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And you need, for those of you visiting with us, you'll have to get the CDs to follow my train of thought. And blasphemy is, the Bible says, that there's no forgiveness for anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit in this life and in that. And what is forgiveness? To get reconnected. That's what it means. So what is sin? To depart from the point that you were connected to. So what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is to reconnect you to the point of your departure. Forget all the peripheral things that are different tiers of sin. Let's talk about the original meaning of sin. To miss the mark. To move away from the point. So what does the Holy Spirit do? He connects you to the point. What's the point? That you will become the interface or the connect, connector or the visible expression of everything God wants to be. And how do you become that expression? Through the Spirit. But if you shame him, violate him, injure him, exclude him, attack him, discredit him, and behave like that, there's no forgiveness for you because the thing that will connect you to the eternal, to the unseen, has been interrupted. It's like if telecom disconnects your line, you can talk on the phone as much as you want. You're talking to yourself. Okay? If you do not have a line, if we don't have a signal in this in this house right now, then we would not be able to be connected to the website. We'd not be able to Google things. We'd not be able to send our emails to our global, you know, community of people that follow our teachings and whatever. We need connection. And if you go and disconnect with the Holy Spirit, there's no hope for you in this life or the life to come. So don't fight God. Don't fight the Holy Spirit. Just get yourself plugged in and say, I'll stay, no matter, even if I don't understand anything, I'll be faithful even if I have to die for being faithful. That's how you connect it. That's an attitude. I feel like a preacher today. 
don't know what happened to me. I didn't have breakfast. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> But the point I'm making is we need the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have him in this life, you're kaputz. If you, in the next life, there's no hope. So come on, come on. You can't receive Christ but by the Spirit. By the Spirit. That's why we need to put the greatest value on the Holy Spirit in our lives. Put, it, put him as your highest, the highest premium that you have. I mean, if you have in the law and in, the, in your world of estimates, make him the priceless one. You can lose everything else, but this is, this is more than a family heirloom. This is a gift from God to us. God comes to us in the Spirit. And we refer to that as the Holy Spirit. When I see people just being indifferent uh, to God, that is blasphemy. Okay, maybe you're doing it unconsciously, but after today, you're in trouble now. I'm, I just told you. So you can't do it unconsciously. You know what's going to happen to you, so, so fix the problem. And to know the things. You know, a lot of people say, but the things that come from pulpits like this are so difficult to understand. So difficult. Why can't they keep it simple? Well, let me tell you something. There's nothing simple about the things of God. Even though there is such a thing called sincerity or purity or innocence in God. The things of God are very easy to comprehend. But you can have the highest IQ in this house and never understand the things of God until you have the Holy Spirit. Because He is the Spirit of understanding and He is the Spirit of interpretation and He's the one that will ass- assemble your thoughts and assimilate the things of God in you so that you can understand. So, so I'm asking you today to beg the Holy Spirit to always be with you and never to live outside of the economy of the Spirit of God. Can you understand this? This is very important. Uh, one cannot claim to belong to God if such a person does not possess the Spirit. And you can't tell me This is where I have a problem where some people think we can share our bodies with all kinds of spirits. The Holy, the, 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 the Lord, the God that I serve is such a jealous God that he will not share your body with another spirit. Do you think he's going to share your bed if you're sleeping with somebody else? No. No, absolutely not. He's not going to allow his, his Holy Spirit to come into a place who has an evil spirit, an unclean spirit, the spirit of a Philistine, uh, or the spirit of the Chaldean, or some spirit in the world, and there are many spirits here, and we'll talk about it. Uh, he only wants to stay in you if you choose to live by his rules. And that's how we get connected. So you, you can't say you possess God if there's another spirit in you. Amen? The Holy Spirit is appointed to put the Spirit of God into every son of God by the breath that he, has given, uh, that he gives us. And so he breathes upon us so that the Spirit of the Son could be. And that's how our bodies become the vessels in which the Holy Spirit dwells. He's dwelled. So say to yourself, I am the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, I really want to talk about the promise today, and then I want to go, if time permits, and time does go very quickly in this place. Um, if time permits, I want to talk about the Holy Spirit and Jesus, because that's the supreme example. I want to talk about the promise today. God made promises. Everyone say promise. God made many promises in Scripture, and I'll explain some of them to you. He made a promise to Abraham, but the promise could be on different tiers. He promised Abraham's natural seed, a land in the Middle East. Okay, that's a natural Israel, not the true Israel, not the eternal Israel. Because later on, Paul explains that. So the Middle East people, the Israel in the Middle East is a blessed nation today. Blessed because God made a promise to Abraham that his seed will occupy that. That's the natural 12 tribes. And, uh, and those promises, the Bible says, the promises of God, they are yes and amen. Uh, God promised uh, the land. He promised them blessings like riches. He promised them that their seed will be very successful. He even made a promise to Ishmael through Hagar. He said, because Ishmael 
comes out of Hagar's loins, out of uh, Abraham's loins. Remember, Hagar was the Egyptian maid uh, who was going to be used as the surrogate mother to produce a, a line for Abraham because Abraham did not believe that his barren wife, Sarah, would produce a son. And he listened to his wife, wife who was now getting desperate. Uh, she was, you know, advanced in age. And uh, he listened to his wife and uh, went and impregnated his maid. And maids in those days was the ownership of the wife. So she was now going to become the surrogate mother or the womb through which Abraham's seed will be blessed. And when Agar saw, when, when Agar had the child, she felt that she was now an equal to Sarah and started to mock Sarah. Mock Sarah and, um, and Sarah was very, very offended by that. And she couldn't tolerate now the fact that a maid could produce a son for her husband, but she could not. And so she expelled her from the house, from the tent, from the dwelling. And uh, Hagar was found in the wilderness weeping with her son Ishmael. And God appeared to Hagar and said, Look, listen, because Abraham made a mistake, but the covenant is on him, I will bless your children also. He won't be the son of promise. He won't, but he will be blessed. And today you see the Middle Eastern countries, some of the, the Arab tribes there, like the Islamic people and others, that are very, very blessed even though they're not in Christ. So there are promises. There are promises. Uh, but these are, these are promises that God will honor. God will bless. But they're not eternal promises. And God's made other promises like he'll give us eternal life. He'll give us eternal life. He'll give us an eternal inheritance. That's a promise. And there are multiple promises. Multiple promises. But one of the greatest promises God made to Abraham, and we cannot see it when we just read the lines, uh, when God said, I promise, I swear, I take an oath, and I can't vow by anything, so I'll swear by my word and by myself, by my name, basically. So God swore by two immutable things, that he, uh, by which he cannot lie. And he vowed to Abraham that his seed will be blessed. And that seed is not natural Israel. It's spiritual Israel, which includes all of us, where we become one new man in Christ, where there's neither Jew nor Gentile, we all are collapsed into one new, new bunch of people. And that wall of demarcation was separated. Uh, and so there were many promises. But one of the promises we never could see, never could see, um, was the promise of the Holy Spirit. God didn't promise land to the church. Although he's promised the whole of creation to us. The natural Jew gets the Middle East and gets lots of riches in this world. But the spiritual Jew, which is the church of Jesus Christ, the new Israel, the descending reality, the Jerusalem from above, that Jew is promised that he will get everything in Christ. Everything in heaven, everything on earth will be given to us. And those are great promises. But one of the promises God makes to us is that we will receive the Holy Spirit. And what God is saying is I'm making a promise to you that I'm not just going to give you everything I created. I'm going to give you myself. Are you understanding that? I'm going to give you myself in the form of the Holy Spirit. And when he comes upon you, when he comes upon you, you are going to become the official place through which I exist. I live. I have dominion. That's an amazing promise. So let's read some scriptures about this promise. Uh, in, in Psalm 105, verse 42, for he remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. Okay, and that promise carried various, as I said to you, branches to it. It includes the blessings in the Middle East. Uh, that's what we call the Middle East, the promised land. But we also know that the, the patriarchs were not looking for a land in the earth. They were looking for a city whose builder and maker was... God, and they didn't say a nation there, like Israel. They said a city. Can you imagine all of us living in the city of Jerusalem? Billions and billions of people who have been saved over the years. will never fit. Am I correct? So there is a bigger city. It's a heavenly city. That's a promise. Now, many promises. God remembered it. But let's look at some of the promises. Luke twenty-four forty-nine. Why am I saying this? 
Because the promises of God cannot fail. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. What God says is a done deal. It's sealed. Okay? It can't be reversed, revoked, rescinded. It is done. I want to bring you to a place where you understand. We're not talking about promises that can be broken. How many people have broken their promises with us? How many people before an altar have broken their promises? How many business partners that said we will be joined together forever and then one day they betray? Once somebody betrays somebody or they betray each other, whatever. Promises are broken. But in God, what God promises is yes and amen. It can't change. So I want you to believe this. Some of you put your trust more in the promises of man than you do in the promise of the only God. Okay? And when he promised, he vowed. He swore an oath. Okay? And that's how serious he was. And you know the word oath means seven promises. Uh, uh, when, you, when you get to a, a place of oath, it's, it's, it's called the place of seven promises. And in other words, it's sealed repeatedly. It cannot in any way be diminished or revoked. That's how important it is. And, and for me, you know what? If the charismatic and Pentecostal gospel fell into the trap of trying to sell things to us or promote things to us if they didn't sell it. But I want you to come to understand, if you live, I'm not saying it'll happen because I don't believe God has, has denied us certain privileges, but if you live like a pauper for the rest of your life on the earth, But you know that you have the promise of the Holy Spirit and is in you. You are richer than the richest people in the earth. Because there's nothing more richer you can get than God himself through the Holy Spirit. Are you understanding me? So that's a promise. So you should believe it. And believe me when I tell you, if you get that promise, you'll even see how your life will improve. Uh, it It will improve measurably. Behold, I send... The promise of, of my Father upon you. Luke 24, 29. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But, and this is a very important but, okay? But, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Okay, so he's saying here, this is a promise of the Father that I'm going to send. Acts 2.33. Let's read it. Because in Acts chapter 1, no, Acts chapter 1 first. Acts 1, four, And being assembled together, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for what? Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. So wait. So what is the promise again, Yem? Yeah? The Holy Spirit. We know that. Acts 2.33. Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God. Acts 2.33. And having received from the Father the promise of what? The Holy Spirit. He poured out this which you now see and hear. Peter's preaching his first sermon. And he says, when, when Jesus ascended and sat on the throne took his position. Remember the picture in in Revelation chapter 5, how there's a scroll in the hand of God which carries all the codes and the secrets for how we would live on the earth. Uh, The unfolding of histories, past, present, and future, or present, past, and future, as the scriptures would say. Uh, All of that is in the scroll. Mysteries, uh, inventions, the thoughts of God. Everything is in the scroll. And the prophet who knows that if you can't see into the things of God, you, we will not be able to inform people in the earth how to structure their their, their, their ways. And so he starts to cry. And then uh, an elder, not an angel, comes to the prophet John. The Apostle John, who has a prophetic thrust to his life, says to him, don't cry. Behold, the lamb, the lion of the tribe of Judah, has prevailed to break open the seals. And he looks in in the corner of that scene, and he discovers a lamb who is called a lion. And when that lamb comes to the throne, and he's already wounded, he's already 
been sacrificed on the cross. He's coming after the cross. That's his coronation. And when he takes the throne, breaks the seals, things start to happen. And the Holy Spirit, if you read Revelation chapter 5, starts to proceed from the throne. The seven spirits of God. What's happened? When he went there to, and took the throne, which was around the, 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 the period of his coronation, which is the 50th day from his resurrection from his death and resurrection. On that 50th day when he took the throne and broke the seals, the seven spirits of God was released upon the church and that was how the promise was released. So he said to the disciples, you can't do anything in the earth with all the teachings you have. You may be loaded with information. You may be able to tell people about the 42 weeks that you walked with me, the three and a half years. You can tell them about the things we did, you know, in the privacy of our home when we sat and chatted, or on the mountaintop, or how I healed the people, or how I walked on water, and all of that stuff. But you can't do anything until you receive the promise. And when I get to the throne, the Father has promised that the same spirit that was in me, we're going to now put it in you. And the spirit of the most high God, the holy God. So he goes to the throne, and the spirit is released, and that is exactly on the 50th day, 10 days after he ascended. The spirit is released, and the church is born in power. Do you need the promise? Yes. Yes. The Holy Spirit is the promise. Say to your neighbor, the Holy Spirit is the promise of the Father. Acts 2, 38, 40. I'm reading a whole lot of scriptures. He's on lay foundation. Then Peter said to them, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And that's one of the preconditions to the promise. You can't just get it if you don't change your mind. You don't receive baptism. Remember what I told you in one of my sessions? We are not filled with the Holy Spirit first. We are baptized into the Spirit. And after we are baptized in the Spirit, we receive infillings of the Spirit. I don't know if I'm using the right word here, but think about osmosis. Think about how you can be in an environment and then then absorb everything. The prophecy here can talk about those things. But the absorbing of that... That presence. So when you are in the Holy Spirit, you have to know how to receive him, absorb him, absorb him into your spirit. That's called infilling. You're not just filled. You are in the spirit, baptized into the spirit. You're not baptized with the spirit. That's a bad translation in the Bible. Uh, Acts 1, 8. You're not baptized with the spirit. It's a word N in the Greek, which means you are baptized in the spirit. And the word N means finality of position. It means fix, a fixation in terms of being, or, or being affixed to a place of rest. It means, and I've used this word when I teach you, and I've taught you on many occasions, uh, there's other words that, this, that helps you to understand the word en, which means in. There's words like the word ek, it means movement out of. There's the word in the Greek, ace, which is movement into something. So it is a kind of an ambivalent position where you can move into something. Okay? And if you move into something, the the possibility is you can also move out of something. But when you talk about the word in, it means you are now brought into a final position. It's like the die is cast. It's like when you come, when, when, the, when he says, I will send the Holy Spirit upon you, or I'll send him as a promise to you, which the Father promised, is basically saying, I'm not just going to send him to you, I'm going to send you into him before he comes into you. So you come into him in a final place of rest. When you are in the Spirit, you can't move out of the Spirit. The only way it can happen is not by the Holy Spirit. It's by you choosing not to live in him. That's called volitional thinking of free choice. It's a moral principle. So if I am baptized in the Holy Spirit, it means that I'm now marinating. Think about pickle. Think about vinegar. A chili in a bottle of vinegar. Think about oil. You know, Indians. Mangoes in a bottle of oil. That's pickle. And, um, and some of you have stories about that, how it, it's pickled. You are now put into 
the Holy Spirit. And when you are in the Holy Spirit, you absorb him into your life. Or you can choose not to absorb him. That is the free choice principle. And that's where there are no many fillings. You understand? So I want to be continuously filled. So I'm saying, come, I'm absorbing you. Permeate my membrane. Permeate my flesh. Uh, saturate every part of me. Let there be no restraint in me. Uh, help me never to fight you. Because that's the only way this process of being absorbed, saturated, or osmosis, or whatever they call it, uh, takes place. You must allow for yourselves to, to be, for the Holy Spirit to be absorbed into you. Amen? So while you may be in the Spirit, the Spirit may not be in you. It's like God can bring you out of Egypt. But he'll wait for you to get rid of Egypt out of you. And some people can leave Egypt, but not let Egypt leave them. Okay? And some people can possess things, but eventually the things they possess, possess them. That's what I want to see happen. We may possess the Holy Spirit as a promise, but now you must let him possess you. That's the positive. And if you are possessed, get possessed with the Holy Spirit, not some demon. Okay, there's too many demons in the church right now. Okay, and you shall receive. Everyone say, you shall receive. The gift of the Holy Spirit. So is the Holy Spirit a gift? You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the promise comes to us as a gift. For the promise is to you and your children, and to all who are are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So who is the promise to? And I can read this on various levels. To everyone in that generation, and future generations, which is called transgenerational or next generational building. But it also could literally mean you, your baby, your growing child, five years old, your 12-year-old, your 17-year-old, your 25-year-old, and everybody else. So who's the promise for? Not just the holy, righteous people, anyone who has received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You know what's my heart? My heart is that every child in this church will be filled with the Holy Spirit, but they will also be baptized in the Spirit. It's my heart. Your desire should be that every one of your children should know the Holy Ghost because that's the only way they'll know Christ and never leave God. Believe me when I tell you. They may slip away for a season, like many of us did when we were. When I was a little boy, I got baptized. Got to matric, just lost my traction, lost my focus. At the age of 22, came back to the Lord. And I believe, and that same spirit, while I was... refilled by that same spirit that allowed me to speak in tongues when I was a little boy is the spirit that was operating in me after I came and got cleaned out again. You understanding? Let me tell you something. We must bring the spirit into our kids. You must lay hands on your kids gently when they're sleeping and say, Lord, I pass that spirit on them. They will have no other spirit, not the spirit of this world, not the spirit of Egypt, not the spirit of the age, not the the spirit of the air, not the spirit uh, that comes, uh, and there are many roving spirits in the earth today. Not the spirit of the sons of Sceva, or, or, or the spirit of legion, or whatever spirit, the spirit of infirmity. I want the spirit of the Holy Ghost to be upon my children. You must believe that. You don't have to be old. Young people, listen to me. You don't have to be my age to get the Holy Spirit. God will come to you on your terms, on your level. Not your terms, on your level. He'll come to you on your turf. That's a better word. Okay? He'll come to you and he'll fill you. And when you have the Holy Spirit, you don't need drugs. You don't need alcohol. You don't need something to give you a high. Because the Holy Spirit will make you. He won't make you high. He'll just make you exalted in Christ. You understand? He'll satisfy you in areas that this world can't satisfy you. You won't need pornography. 
You would not need all these addictions and vices in the world. You will be filled with only a desire for the things of God. That's the spirit I want to see come into our lives. Amen. Can you believe with me that even our children can get filled? Young people, can you believe with me that you can get filled? Amen. Will you hunger and thirst, which is the currency in the spirit, to get the things of God? You can't buy it. You can't earn it. But if there is a transactory medium through which you can access the things of the spirit, it's called hunger and thirst. God never gives his spirit to people who are not hungry and thirsty. They that wait upon the Lord. They that tarry in the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Amen? They shall, how does it go? They shall run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. And what else? Okay, Isaiah 41, I think it is, 31. Whatever, whatever. The Holy Spirit is letting me down now. (laughs) But what I'm saying is, let me tell you, when you wait upon him, he'll come. He'll give you wings like an eagle. You will outrun chariots. You will outrace angels. You will do things that anything in creation can't do. Why? Because we're not talking about the battery life they have. We're talking about the Holy Spirit who cannot be quenched now operating in us. The very Spirit of God. So, so the promise is a gift, and it's not just given. It's not just given to the mature or the adults. It's given to anyone who will accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And this is not an interfaith position. Okay? Jesus is the only way. You can't say, oh yes, I believe in Jesus, and I'll get his spirit, and I believe in another deity out there, and I'll get his spirit also. There's only one spirit, and it only comes from the sons of God. Amen? Acts seven 17. I'm giving you all the scriptures. And when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. That's the Old Testament reference. Okay, Acts 23, 21. But do not yield to them, for more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, waiting for the promise from you. These are different scriptures with the word promise, but I'm just highlighting it for you. But Romans chapter 4 is where I'm going to get to. Romans chapter 4, verse 13 to 25. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So how do you get the promise? Through faith. Everyone say, you get the promise through faith. For if those who are of the law are his, faith is made void and the promise is made of no effect. That's natural Israel. That's the Jews. That's the, people, that's the people that have not accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. They still live, live many of them, by the law. Because so the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be made, might be sure to all the seed. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Adam, uh, of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Say, Abraham is our father. Okay, so if you want to know whether you have a lineage in Christ, and if you want to track that lineage back to the Old Testament, then Abraham is our father. Abraham is our father. So if the Jews say Abraham is their father, you can say, yes, he's my father too. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him... Whom he believed, God who, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. That's us. Everyone say it, us. us. We are the descendants of Abraham. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform, 
and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. For, and now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for, come on, talk to me, talk to me, for us. So whatever God promised Abraham, he promised us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification, which is our legal position of being integrated into the family of God. So what is the Bible saying here? Whatever God promised, and there are many promises that he made to Abraham, but one of the promises that I believe that Abraham could not see the way we are seeing It's the promise of the Holy Spirit, which makes us the seed of Christ. And so whatever. And that's why I want you to start believing God, that if the Holy Spirit is in you, He'll give you the power to reclaim every other promise. That's the point I want to make. Okay? And you need to learn how to wait for this promise. And how does this promise come to you? It comes by faith. So what do you have to do to believe in the promise? Not sit back and say, oh, well, it's just a promise. So, you know, you have to learn how to access it by faith. In other words, build it into your system. Listen, there's many things I do in my spirit, with my spirit. The spirit that God put in me that is governed by the Holy Spirit. I tell my spirit because it's subject to me, my whole being, my volition, the way I think. I tell my spirit to do things, even if I don't confess it every day. A religious person will put scriptures on the walls, on doors, you know, they'll confess it all the time. There's nothing wrong in doing that. If that's going to build you up, do it. But don't do it religiously. Do it spiritually. But for me, I, I paste things into my spirit. I paste them. I cut them out of the scriptures and I paste them until they grow into my spirit. I install them. You know, this is uh, when I install these things into my spirit, I create a kind of a biot, bi- 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 biopic a kind of a culture in my spirit where my spirit also can start to um, see things and do things. So I post things into my spirit like, you will be praying for this church all the time. My spirit knows it must intercede for every one of you. I don't call your names every day. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I do. I, I think of a person, if the Holy Spirit you know, highlights it in my spirit, and I will just tell my spirit, intercede for that person. The Holy Spirit, together with my spirit, worked in, tangent, in tandem to, to, to intercede. Um, there are times I carry a burden in my spirit for people, and I, I, I'm aware of that. The Holy, my spirit and the Holy Spirit, they talk to each other. Uh, so, so, and there are times, like, you know, if I'm out of town, like, we leave today to be away for four days. Um, you know, if I leave, I know that my spirit is connected to the spirit of this house because it's installed there. This family is mine. The global family is mine. We've got one or two of our pastors globally that are going through serious health problems. I can't pray for them every day because it's not possible with my busy schedule. But my spirit prays for them. Why? It gets undergirded by the Holy Spirit. But there's other thing I do in my spirit, which is the point I want to make. I have installed into my spirit this attitude that I have a promise from my father. He vowed it from my heavenly father. He vowed it. He swore it. He affirmed it. He cannot change it because he he made that promise to Abraham. And that promise is not just that he's going to give me money and wealth and breakthroughs and he's going to make me the head and not the tail. He's going to give me the power to generate wealth And all of those things, and I've seen a a lot of those things happen in my life. But I've installed it in my spirit that God made a promise to Abraham that he will give me the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit, which was the same spirit that created everything from Genesis, that hovered over the waters, that that is called in the book of Proverbs, uh, the craftsman, the master builder. The principle, 
by which God ingeniously weaved and, uh, and fabricated everything we see in creation. I made it a point to say that the residency of that spirit is in my spirit. It's installed in my spirit. And even when my mind tells me you defeated, where is the Holy Spirit? Why are you living contrary to what God promised? My spirit rises up and tells my mind who plays games with me that you don't tell me anything. My father promised it to me. It's in my spirit. So I don't have to live like a schizophrenic or somebody that doesn't know who he is or who has a duplicate personality. I don't have to live like that. I just simply know in my spirit, which can't lie, that I am a son of God because, and I'll come to that point, because he put the promise in me. He didn't just promise me heaven and earth. He promised me himself. And he gave himself to me in the spirit. So it's installed. Please, learn how to upgrade your database, your spirit man. And in upgrading it, sometimes tweak those things. Fine tune it. And remind yourself, I'm, I've got a promise. And we're talking about the promise that cannot be, this is a legal word, it can't be revoked. Absolutely cannot. And, and, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So if I carry that in my spirit, listen to me now. So if I carry that, I have the promise. The spirit is in me. Remember what I told you last week about the word power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it gives you power. I said it's not power like catch my coat so I can show you how many people fall. That's, that's gimmicks. And, and some, it's genuine at times, but it's just theatrics, not gimmicks, theatrics. It's just some people are so caught up with the power in them that they want everyone else to applaud their power. They don't realize it's a gift. They don't realize they should be humbled by it. They don't realize that they should not draw attention upon themselves because they got power. But when I think about power and it's installed in my spirit, it's inherent. It's inherent. What does it mean, inherent? It's installed in me not to work outside of my personality. It works in my personality. There are times when, you know, I'll just lay my hand upon somebody and say, you are blessed. I don't have to pray a long prayer. A long prayer. But in my spirit, in my spirit, I know the inherent power. I know it's the spirit of wisdom. It's the spirit of counsel. It's the spirit of might. It's a, it's a, it's a spirit uh, um, of understanding. Uh, I know it's a spirit that brings the fear of the Lord. That's why if I just step out of, my, of the, uh, out of line, if I just say the wrong thing, I think the wrong thought, the first thing that happens, that spirit in me just rises. And it tells me, come on, Thamel, you are now operating in contradiction to everything I am. And so immediately I have to check myself. Times pick up the phone and say, I'm sorry. Was I rude to you? Because it's in my abrasive personality. Um, did I lose it in the wrong way? And, uh, you know, I have to learn how to do these things and correct things. Why? That spirit, it's inherent. But because it's also the spirit of might, that's the power in me, I have confidence that even if I whisper, things can happen. I remember once, you know, and I was saying this to the conference in Valcom this week, so I'll share it with you. But the spirit of might. I remember once being called by uh, you know, senior members of our Hindu family uh, uh, to come and pray in their house. And this is a very religious family. And there was a demon attacking the house. Have you heard of the Takalosh? <laughs> Portuguese? The European word? I mean, this thing was causing some havoc for years. Moving furniture... And believe me, these things happen. These are real spirits. Real spirits. Some of us live in a sophisticated world. The Holy Spirit, I mean, not the Holy Spirit. These spirits have just upgraded themselves, but they're there. They're moving your furniture, you can't see it. <laughs> and they call me to pray. So I went there, I said, sure, I'll pray. On condition. That for the period that I pray, you don't pray to any God, you don't light your lamps, etc. Okay. If it works, then you decide whether you want that or you're going to choose my God. So I prayed. I prayed a one-minute prayer. Simple. By the authority vested in me, 
I command every unclean spirit in this house to stop its activity. I command you to leave this house and give these people rest. Amen. And I said in Jesus' name, Amen. So I had to make sure they know which name I'm praying in. <laughs> I left the house and they said to me, but you never put oil on the door. I said, how do you know about oil? They said, no, we had other people come and pray like that in this house. Is there anything, is there a Bible that we need to put under the pillow? And so I said, no. I said to them, I've spoken. The spirit in me has arrested those spirits. Those spirits can't manifest against it. I am a man of authority in the spirit. It's a done deal. It's a done deal. I left, and for two days, they had perfect peace. For the first time in years, they slept. Okay, I never scream. I never, you know, do all sorts of crazy stuff. I never walk through every room. I just spoke. I didn't apply anything. I knew the power in the blood. I knew the power in the name of Jesus. I know who I am in him. I know who he is in me. And so, so they called me back. I said, now, you've not prayed to your God for two days. Are you prepared to follow this way? They said, it's very difficult. Very difficult because we are co- committed, we've made vows to our gods, etc. And I said, I'm sorry. If anything happens today, after this, it's not my problem. It is your choice. Don't undermine the authority of my God. And immediately after that, that evening, they lit whatever they did. And the spirits came back. They called me back, and I said, I'm sorry, I can pray, but you'll have temporary rest unless you choose to follow the way that will give you eternal immunity. They chose their way, and they choose to live with demons. But what what is the point? Inherent power. Uh, That's a promise. You don't have to go and put on theatrics. If you just put your trust in the living God, and you know who's in you, believe me, demons will flee a thousand ways. I mean, I never, I mean, recently I've never had the opportunity to cast out demons because they don't come near me. (laughs) I'm teasing. I'm teasing. But, but, you know, we've had occasions when I was in Great Town. In Great Town, I mean, we cut our teeth casting out demons. And I would spend days casting out demons. Sometimes you have to fast for days because I didn't know what the inherent power. And I knew about a fasted life. Then I discovered that if you bind something three times, you lose it two times. If you say, devil, I rebuke you three times, it means the first two times you never believed. That's why the devil has so much of authority over us. Because if you say, I bind you, I bind you, and you talk to the devil for one hour, you lost 59 minutes of your life. Because he's not going to listen to you. Maybe the last minute he'll listen to you in the 60th. So what I've done, I took a decision. I don't care whether you froth, you have an epileptic fit, you speak in 50 languages to me, I'm not talking back to you. I would say to the devil, in the name of Jesus... I command you to come out now, within the hour, and I would leave. If that demon doesn't come out immediately, I'm not going to stay there to talk to him, because he knows the tricks. But I know the power in me. It's, not, it's the power that comes through the cross. So the, there will be an epileptic fit, there will be manifestations. I'm not interested in manifestations, because I know the words I speak can't return to me void. Are you hearing me? And you go. You walk away. And I can guarantee you, I've tested it, within the hour the demon leaves. The problem with us is we love talking to demons because we don't know how to talk to Jesus, to our Father in heaven. Are you hearing me? We need to learn about the inherent power. So when I talk about the promise, it's installed in my spirit. It's installed. How can, if I, if I am in the spirit... If the Spirit is in me, if I am operating in the Word, the blood of Jesus covers me. I am a son of the new covenant. The words I speak, they are spirit and life. I have authority. I do everything in the Spirit. Do you think demons can stand that? 
I mean, demons know that they were finished on the cross of Calvary. We only give them a lifespan. So God is calling the church to come back to understand the inherency of power. Are you with me? And this is very, very important for us to understand. That's the promise. So when I think about how God swore, I mean, can you imagine God swearing of oath before a man? I mean, God is God. He doesn't need to swear anything. He's just God. But he swears an oath and he says, um, all I need you to do is just believe. And if you believe, I'll consider that righteous. And what happens then if you're classified or legally justified righteous as a son of God? That means that's your legal position. You go and try and contest a legal position today. The lawyers here will tell you that on the principle of the law um, um, uh, or the tenets of our, our constitution, you cannot violate that if it's a legal position. Even if you see a sickly man sitting on the bench, you know that his authority will be to exercise or to establish that law. It's a promulgation that comes. How much more should you understand in your spirit that if you just believe the promise, God looks at you and says, you clothed in righteousness and you're in a legal position, which literally means I've justified you to be a son of God and there's no condemnation for you. Why? Because this is not in the flesh. And what is the first promise he gives us? And I'll show you that time will not permit today. But I will show you that when we do get to it. God really, to, for the fulfillment of any promise in your life, you need the cardinal promise, which is the, the Holy Spirit. This is an ordinal, cardinal, eternal, uh, indestructible, irrevocable, uh, absolutely established thing that the, the, the way you access promise is by receiving the first promise, which is the Holy Spirit. All the other stuff about houses and cars and breakthroughs and good jobs and happy marriages will automatically fall in their places. Don't focus on those things. Get the Holy Ghost. Amen? Let me tell you something. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You will have happiness in life. Because the Spirit of God, it doesn't give you happiness. It gives you joy. Joy in the Holy Ghost. It's normal. You'll, be a, you'll just be, you will be smiling through life even if you're bleeding, you know, in certain areas. Why? Because you know who is for you. Everyone say the promise. And God swore it. God vowed it. And when you believe it, it's a legal term. The word accounting here, yeah, it's a legal term. It's, a, it's an accounting term. It really means to transfer it. In modern language, EFT. EFT. It's an electronic funds transfer, but he EFTs into your life a position. He, he, he puts you into a position. He transfers to you everything you need. He, and it's accounted as not rich, not billionaire. It's accounted as righteous. And righteousness is the whole culture of kingdom living. Uh, and when you operate in the order of Melchizedek, the high priestly order of Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek operated in righteousness and peace, but the order of Melchizedek given to us through Jesus Christ, the priesthood, the high priesthood, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The natural Melchizedek could not give us joy because the Holy Spirit was not given the way it comes to the new covenant. But in the order of Christ, and that order we are assembled in, we also receive joy. It's an inward state of being. Let me tell you, strength is not determined by image, by persona, by your physique. It's not determined by how you present yourself to the world. Strength is determined by the measure of joy you have in you. And when the Holy Spirit is there, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen? So you need it. You need it. And so God calls the church here. God calls the church to start believing, believing. One more scripture and we'll close. Romans 9, 1 to, 1 to 14. It's a long one, but let me just read it quickly. I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. I mean, can you imagine the apostle saying that? My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. So where's the witness in the Holy Spirit? Witness. 
that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could, I, I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh. Those are the Jews who are Israelites, to whom pertains the adoption, the glory, the covenants. All these things were given to these people. Adoption into sonship. The carrying of the reputation, the statue of God, called the glory. The covenants, which are all the promise, all the blessings of God. The giving of the law, the legal statutes of God. The service of God, how you function in, in, the, in the culture of the kingdom of God. And of the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. Next verse. But it is... It is not that the word of God has taken no effect. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of, uh, uh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are, ca- are counted as a seed or as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. Now this is the promise that comes. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, this is one of the things that should happen. And not only this, but when Rebecca had conceived by one man, even by our own father Isaac, for the children not being born, not having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the, the, the younger, as it is written. As it is written. What shall we say then? Is there righteousness with God? Uh, certainly, unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. But here's the point that's being highlighted here. And you can go and read the whole text. I'm jumping. Jumping. The promise that God made to Isaac, uh, to, 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 to Sarah, was a promise that Isaac will be the son. And Isaac was born to parents who could not have children. So whatever happened, happened by the power of the Holy Ghost. God's Spirit took that dead seed from from Abraham's loins and put it into the womb or activated it in the womb, okay, of Sarah. Right. And when that happened, God was saying in Isaac that I will raise up a children that will come forth that is not of the flesh, but of the Spirit. And the promise is that when the Spirit comes, and there's other accompanying scriptures which I will read next week, when the Spirit comes upon, that, upon, uh, upon those people, the promise of sonship automatically takes place in your wombs. In other words, when the Spirit of God comes into, upon you, the Spirit of ab- adoption is activated, and the Spirit of ar- adoption automatically cries out from within you, Papa, Abba, Father. So when the Spirit comes, and this is what God vowed to Abraham. He says, Abraham, I want you to just believe. There's going to come a day when I'm going to release a bunch of kids in the earth. And all of those kids are going to be part of my righteous order. They are going to be like the stars of the sky, like the grain of sand on the seashore. Abraham, they're going to be so innumerable that they're going to govern the heavens and the earth. They are going to be made of two compositions, of a heavenly composition and an earthly composition. And when that spirit is upon them, they're going to function as my sons in the earth. So why do we need the promise of the Holy Spirit? We need the promise of the Holy Spirit to remind us who our daddy is. And who is our father? God. Without the Holy Spirit, you'll never know God as your father. You'll know him as miracle worker, creator, mighty God, you know, all sorts of things. But you'll never know him as papa. Do you know that a large percentage of the church today in the earth doesn't know God as their father. They can confess him with their mouths, but their hearts don't believe it. But you can't get conf- confession without belief. So if you want to be reckoned righteous, you need the Holy Ghost. And when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, what's he going to do within you? He's going to cry out, listen, 
You may have had a bad father. You may have been a delinquent. You may have been born out of wedlock. You may not even know your family tree. You lost your parents at a young age. You've been an orphan. Or you just have a bad memory. Or you just have wonderful memories of your parents. But that doesn't matter. When that spirit of promise comes upon you, all the other promises are made to Abraham now becomes active. And what is one of them? Your kids, your children, which are born of the spirit, not of natural flesh, will rule over everything I created. That's us. That's us. So can you see how important it is? What do we Pentecostals do? We reduce the Holy Spirit to floor time, to goosebumps, to screaming, to vision, to dreams, and all those things we'll have in this house. Maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. But if the Holy Spirit moves in those ways, we'll have those things. But that's not my focus. I want the Spirit in us so that we can get back to our original intent in God. Amen.